Thank you. I wanted to introduce our next panel, which is going to look at a lot of different aspects of how this pandemic has impacted identity and authentication. Uh, Jamie Denker uh, is a friend and former colleague from Time and Government together, uh, who will be leading the moderator, uh, leading as a moderator here. Uh, Jamie, let me hand it off to you to introduce your panel. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. I um, hope you can all hear me okay. I'm Jamie Danker, Vice President of Privacy at Easy Dynamics Corporation, and excited to be here today to talk to um, some experts here. We've got a broad range of perspectives from the public sector and the private sector, um, each with unique, I think, observations to share. Um, so I'll tell you the names of all the participants, and I'm going to go around the virtual room, just let them introduce. as many as possible. So we have Sanjay Gupta with the Small Business Administration, James Rudolo from Grant Thornton, Neil Kumarani from Gmail, I'm sorry, from Google, and Nicole Booth from Notarize. Um, so Sanjay, um, will you go ahead and just introduce yourself briefly? briefly? Hi, uh, thank you, Jamie, for inviting me to the panel. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm the Chief Technology Officer with the US Small Business Administration. Uh, briefly, I've been here for about four years, uh, first stint in the federal government. Prior to that, I had about 10 to 14 plus years as CIO, CTO in the private sector. And I've also led a consulting practice with a, a leading market research firm and I published uh, 20 research papers from a fellow CIO, CTOs with another market research firm. So that's been a quick nutshell. Back to you, Jay. Great, thanks. Um, Neil. Hey, Neil Kamaran. I'm the product manager for Gmail Security and the anti-malware platform that we have that protects our products. Uh, prior to this, I was on our payment fraud team here actually for, for quite a while, working on that payment risk and finding fraud across our products. Thank you, James. Hi everyone, I'm James Rotolo. I'm a senior manager at Grant Thornton. Uh, Grant Thornton is the fifth largest accounting firm in the United States, and uh, we have a consulting practice that focuses around fraud risk mitigation. So I work with clients uh, um, in a variety of different industries in both public sector and commercial to help them with their fraud challenges. I have a background in, uh, in fraud investigation within the financial services industry, and also uh, worked for a fraud analytics technology company. Uh, for about a decade. So I have a kind of a mix of a technical and, and business background in this space. Uh, and then in addition to my day job, I also serve on the board of directors at the uh, nonprofit Identity Theft Resource Center, who is uh, helping put on the conference today. So happy to be here. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, it's nice to see you all. My name is Nicole Booth, Executive Vice President for Notarize. Notarize is the remote online notarization platform. We like to say we do uh, digital identity with human assistance. And uh, I uh, previously, in my previous life, I worked for former Ways and Means Chairman Camp in his personal office on the Hill, moved over to KNL Gates. And then um, before moving to Notarize was with uh, the Rock, Rocket family of companies for um, Quicken Loans and the Rock family of companies. So excited to be here today. Great, thank you. All right, well, I'm excited to get started. Um, Sanjay, I'm gonna start with you. Um, so SBA had to respond quickly last year to process Paycheck Protection Program loans worth approximately $350 billion. Can you tell us about SBA's experience uh, and in particular how identity and authentication played a part in SBA's technical solution to process the applications? Yeah, wonderful times actually. Uh, brings back memories from uh, March, late March, April, May timeframe when the first tranche of 350 billion that you mentioned, Jamie, was uh, you know, authorized by the CARES Act. Uh, as some of you may remember, there was also a second tranche authorized for PPP. So the number went clear nearly somewhere like 650 billion. And since then there's another add to it. So it's uh, becoming larger. Anyway, so coming back to your initial ask on that, uh, certainly the need of the hour was quick response. Uh, so we already had existing mechanisms and channels in which lenders interacted with the SBA but the volume and velocity of the transactions um, necessitated us to stand up new portal. And the new portal was directed towards the new lending institutions. And obviously identity and authentication was a key part of it. Uh, so back in 2017, in my early part of my career with SBA, I had uh, instituted a enterprise single sign-on uh, policy and approach and a standard around it. And, and the identity and authentication platform we had chosen was a shared service from the General Services Administration, GSA, a login.gov. Um, obviously, it is a modern cloud-based solution, which is what we needed uh, because of the rapid scaling that uh, the volume of the transactions we were dealing with. Uh, and certainly, so, so we scaled up uh, quickly without any snafus and without any glitches uh, and provided a citizen-facing portal. I went from no portal 
to a fully functional production ready portal in less than a week's time. So, so we're talking about uh, a fairly rich uh, portal, uh, plus uh, you know all of the checks and balances and identity and authentication is a key part of it, obviously. And then the, the theme around here, we're talking about, you know, certainly you want to ensure uh, easy transaction and ease of experience from a customer standpoint. So, so that's what we did. And that became instrumental in part of our uh, response to the PPP program. Great, thanks. Um, can you tell us how SBA is working with the General Services Administration on identity and authentication solutions? You touched on it a little bit already, but if you could give us a little bit more detail. Absolutely. So, so uh, like I said, I'd set this vision and we'd partner with them. Uh, I was obviously looking for a shared service solution, didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So GSA's uh, login.gov solution, if some of you may be aware of, uh, was a perfect fit. And it's a cloud-based solution. So it is available to us as a software as a service. So sort of hit all of my parameters from a standpoint of, uh, you know, of getting a service, a shared service, which is scalable. The beauty of that solution is since uh, uh, it's been continuing to be used across the federal landscape, it helps improve the customer experience or citizen experience. Specifically, if some citizens are already working with an agency, a uh, different agency, it could be SBA even, and they are already using login.gov, so that user experience becomes very simple from that standpoint. And so, so that was our objective going in using that solution. So that's sort of where we started with. Let me give you sort of where we're going with that. Um, so, so the base thing, as all of you probably know, is sort of the basic IEL level one, you know, identity assurance level one, which is basically sort of the, the base level when you get into. Uh, since then, we have uh, started using the what's called as identity assurance level two, or in simple English, identity proofing or identity verification service as well with login.gov. And, and the, the sort of the most exciting part from my standpoint is the fact that uh, we're looking to actually partner with GSA and U.S. Postal Service, who plans to, USPS plans to offer identity proofing services at the postal uh, locations. And here's an interesting factoid, and I'm not a spokesperson for USPS, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that, that apparently uh, on an average, 99% of the U.S. population is within 12 miles of a U.S. post office. So that's a huge help when you're talking about identity proofing and in-person you know, going to a location to get that done. So that's the, the sort of the next frontier for us. Uh, and we're excited to be possibly one of the first pilots with USPS and GSA in, in, in getting to that level of uh, identity proofing. Okay, and then switching gears to a slightly different topic. Um, can you talk about identity and zero trust and what opportunities you see in the new, near term? Absolutely. So, so certainly, I mean, I know well, this focus and forum is around identity and authentication, but if you think about it, uh, the zero trust concept that's been talked about in the industry and, and the federal government at large, the underpinning is identity, if you think about it. So that's one of the key components. So we have been looking at uh, identity from the zero trust angle as well and continuing to expand our zero trust footprint using the identity basis that we have established. And so, yes, uh, we, you know, the traditional identity sources are uh, usually those things based on either Active Directory or Azure Active Directory as well based solution services. So this became very important to us specifically as we all migrated into a telework status. And so one of the things we did and which we had already started implementation is things like conditional access. So, or put differently, it allows us to monitor and manage access to the resources within the SBA based on a variety of conditions uh, based on what they are. So for example, uh, where the user is coming in, their IP address, the user profile, uh, the location of that IP address, it's a public place, it's a private home or an office situation. So all of those signals kind of, if you will take it, get taken into account and dynamically there is a assessment made based on that is to the level of access. Meaning for example, if somebody's trying to use say Office 365, uh, will they be able to download a document or not? Will be dependent on those conditions, which is obviously linked to the identity uh, at the core of it. So that's one of the things we did early on, and that helped us sort of maintain a profile, uh, a good cyber profile, while we were continuing to you know ramp up on our color work. We went up probably five x in the size of SBA from when we started before the pandemic. So that was really key for us. And there's more stuff that we're doing around that. Uh, I'm happy to talk about, but I know we have a lot of other uh, fun panelists here. Yes, I'll, I'll absolutely. Like to hear from and, them as well. and we already have questions for you coming in. So we'll see if we can circle Beautiful. back to it, but I wanna make sure we get through all, all of our speakers here. Um, so James, I'm gonna move on to you. Fraud was touched upon in the prior panel, but love to hear your perspectives on how the pandemic impacted identity and authentication from a fraud perspective and any perspectives you have, um, observations from the public and private sectors and any commonalities that you see. 
Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. I, you know, in my role, I get the benefit of being able to work with both public sector agencies as well as private sector companies. And so I kind of see some trends uh, that occur universally. And even before the pandemic started, uh, identity fraud was a growing problem, right? So as the financial services industry had really secured uh, transactions against fraud, so think about uh, the chip cards we all carry in our wallet for uh, right now is a good example of a technology that's been put in place to prevent things like counterfeit fraud, which used to be a, a very common type of credit card fraud. So with those protections being rolled out across the financial services industry, the bad guys just moved upstream, right? They decided to, instead of commit transaction fraud, uh, they're committing identity and account fraud. Uh, so they're committing, uh, let's say, new account fraud where they're going to create a synthetic identity, maybe using some people's uh, legitimate PII and personal information and combining it with some bogus information to create a brand new fictitious entity. And they use that to open a new account. Uh, or they commit uh, garden variety identity theft where they steal your identity and log in or, and do an account takeover and access your, uh, your bank. So those identity crimes have been happening even before the pandemic. And of course, they benefit from all of the data breaches that have happened over the last several years, right? Everybody's information is available for sale on the dark web. So that whole experience really trained them well to take advantage of what uh, has become the COVID stimulus programs now. So they really had a good sort of training ground to try this out. And this you know, massive tidal wave of, of funding that's come out associated with, uh, with the pandemic has really presented a great opportunity for them to exploit their skills. And so you know, I'm happy to hear what uh, Sanjay is working on at SBA. I don't know if everybody realizes that the amount of money funneled through the SBA program uh, in this short period of time uh, in terms of the loans that were issued is more money that's been loaned by the SBA in that time period than in their entire 67 year history combined. Right, so the, the massive scope and scale of this is huge. So we're gonna expect some fraud. Uh, we've seen things like impersonating um, uh, personal protective equipment vendors and sort of taking on the identity of a corporation that's not even legitimate in order to commit procurement fraud. Uh, we've all read about unemployment fraud scams and we'll probably hear a little bit more about that on the panel today, uh, as well as the, uh, the scams associated with the PPP and idle loan program. So, uh, really just fuel on the fire, I would say, in terms of a, a, a accelerating a fraud problem that we already had. Um, so Jeremy already mentioned this, uh, the Krebs on security post, the tax man cometh for ID theft victims, which highlights complications of unemployment fraud and that soon individuals are going to receive tax collection notices on benefits they never received. So based on your experience, including with the Identity Theft Resource Center, can you highlight some of the impacts to individuals of fraud, uh, including the less highlighted um, non-financial impacts. Sure, sure. So I, I think we're going to see two very substantial issues this tax season. The first is the one you just mentioned, which is where people are going to receive a notice from the IRS that, um, or from their, their state that they've received unemployment benefits. Um, and when in fact, they've never applied or received any of those benefits. And so, you know, that's a scenario where identity fraud has been committed. Somebody else has collected those benefits under your name. Uh, and so there's going to be some challenges. People are going to have to deal with that situation. But this, the second scenario that's related is you, we're going to see a massive uptick, uh, I believe, in tax refund fraud as well. So it's the same methodology where a fraud actor files in your name and files your taxes and has the refund check sent to them. Uh, of course, they fill out the information in such a way to make sure that they get a nice fat refund. Uh, when you go to file your taxes, if, uh, if they've already done that, you'll find that the IRS says, nope, you're, you're all set. You've already filed your taxes and we've sent you a refund, right? So uh, I think a lot of people will discover these things that they didn't even know that they're already the victim of identity theft. Uh, so those are going to be some challenges I think we're going to see. Uh, and we've seen that in the past, but I think we're going to see it much worse this year. Um, and then beyond the financial impacts, uh, obviously everybody know that, knows that there's some big dollar figures here, uh, but Eva in her last session just talked about the aftermath study uh, that the Identity Theft Resource Center conducts. And the, re the reality is that once you discover you're the victim of identity theft, that's when really the pain and the suffering and the problems really start. <laughs> Right, so now you have to go through the process of remediating it and dealing with all of the banks and insurance companies and, and all of your accounts. Um, you know, over 70 plus percent of victims report increased stress levels and the majority of them have actual physical symptoms, uh, fatigue and, and other issues 
uh, that impact their health. Uh, we saw from, from Eva's comments about you know, increased suicide rates and things like that. People have trust issues with their families and their coworkers, right? All of those are, are major issues. And in fact, uh, we see a significant portion, uh, 30 plus percent of people actually need to seek mental health treatment uh, as a direct result of their experience of, of having uh, been the victim of identity theft. So it's really, you know, we, we have a lot of focus in the media around the financial costs, uh, but there really are some tremendous impacts to people's employments, their health, their welfare uh, that often go unnoticed. And uh, we'd love to see some more funding to Eva's point uh, around victim services programs to help support that in the future. Great, thanks. Now this one I feel like is the, hard, the hardest question. Um, so you have about three minutes to answer it. Um, getting COVID relief funding quickly into the hands of small businesses and individuals who need it is an important priority, um, but so is combating fraud. Um, from your perspective, how should agencies like the Small Business Administration and the Internal Revenue Service balance these priorities? Yeah, it's a great question. And the reality is that addressing fraud has always been an issue of balance, right? So we could stop all of the fraud, uh, but that would basically mean stopping commerce, <laughs> right? We can't exchange funds, right? And, and so certainly in a pandemic stimulus uh, program, that's not really an option, right? We can't just shut off the spigot. So, uh, so in fact, we should really tolerate a higher level of fraud in this program because it's so important to get the funds out as quickly as possible to those that, gen that genuinely need it, right? So we should be able to tolerate a, a bit higher fraud rate than normal. But the reality is that the one thing we learned through the first iteration and, and uh, the first round of PVP uh, loans, for example, is that we can't just rely on people self-certifying that they're telling the truth, uh, because the reality is that a lot of people lied. And so the, you know, the volume and the, and the rate of fraud is significant. So what we need are implement some basic controls that you know, verify some of the information to prevent payments going to uh, people that are incarcerated. You know, payments going to people that have died, uh, to people that are already on the government's do not pay list that have, you know, are in ineligible for, uh, for these types of funds. So there are some basic things that we need to do to make sure that we're taking those steps to prevent the obvious frauds. And I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, Sanjay's comments and some of the things that SBA is already doing uh, in rolling out new programs and sort of improving their, uh, their identity proofing capabilities. So I think we're, we're headed in the right direction. You know, we need to get through this process and then tomorrow, we can decide how much energy we want to spend uh, investigating and prosecuting the egregious offenders that, that slip through the cracks and, and make it through those controls. But uh, we do need to strike that balance. Great, thank you. And um, if, if we can, if we have time at the end of the panel, I'd welcome other panelists' response to, to that very question. Um, Neil uh, from Google, Google posted two blogs last year on protecting Gmail users from COVID-19 related attacks. One highlighted phishing as still one of the most effective methods that attackers use to compromise accounts and gain access to company data and resources. Can you walk us through the types of attacks Google saw on Gmail and how you built protections around them? Yeah, sure. So in general, Jamie, as you can imagine, Gmail sees almost every conceivable type of attack, right? What was really interesting to us about COVID, though, was that it gave us the opportunity to observe how quickly attacks shifted into a topic that was just brand new and thrown to the zeitgeist out of nowhere. Unsurprisingly, I think we saw attackers immediately start to use COVID as a lure across the board. So for spam, we saw everything from topical spam, things like low quality PPE sales to spammers. Uh, we also saw COVID just being used as a lure in an email subject with completely unrelated run, everyday run of the mill bulk spam. Switching over to malicious attacks, COVID was used as a convincing lure there too. Everything from impersonation of governmental agencies and health organizations to fake invoices for COVID supplies. To give you a sense of scale, over the course of just a few weeks, we were seeing more than 240 million spam messages every single day and over 18 million COVID-related phishing and malware attacks daily. Now, as for how we protected against these things, in general, we mostly did what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. The vast majority of our protections are actually built in a way that they're content agnostic. And so they adapted almost immediately, ensuring that our filters maintained a high level of quality. To a lesser extent, as these attacks rose in prominence, our security analysts started analyzing patterns and threats and added VSOA protections wherever necessary. I think our general takeaway, though, and what I'd suggest to interested folks that are listening right now, is that our focus and other uh, people's focus should always be on building resilient protections and processes. Attacks commonly shift. COVID, I think, was particularly interesting just due to like the scale and how quickly things shifted, but this happens all the time. 
And so we need to make sure the protections we build across the industry are not primarily dependent on manual updates or manual intervention, but that things shift automatically. There's one other really interesting angle to the COVID attacks, but I'm pretty sure we'll get to it soon. So uh, maybe I'll stop there. Sorry, I just realized I was on mute. That, that was bound to happen. I just didn't realize it was going to be me who was going to be the first. Um, what safety recommendations do you have for users and organizations to protect themselves against COVID-19 related threats? It's a really good question and also exactly what I wanted to get to. So <clears throat> what was really unique and interesting about COVID is that many of the top impersonation targets we saw were not the same organizations that we typically saw being impersonated at all. Right. So normally on a day to day basis, social media platforms, financial institutions, large tech platform sign in pages. These are the types of entities that we generally see impersonated. But all of a sudden, effectively overnight, organizations like the WHO, the CDC, or even vendors like 3M that was selling respirator masks, these became the primary targets of spoofing and impersonation. And in many cases, what we observed is these organizations just weren't prepared in terms of best email sending practices. Strong email authentication wasn't used. Useful technologies like DMARC weren't adopted. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, DMARC allows domains to assert who can send emails on their behalf. And it gives email receiving platforms like us guidance on how to treat unauthenticated emails. And so why this is a like, well, question you may ask is why was this a concern if our systems automatically picked up the attacks anyway, right? And I think there's two reasons for this. First is sadly, everyone is in the Gmail user. Second is false positives. So if real mail being sent by organizations is unauthenticated and the fake email we see is also unauthenticated, it becomes really, really difficult to split these things. And it's much more likely that legitimate email from organizations ends up getting caught in the crossfire uh, as abuse and impersonation starts. So we work through with some of these organizations, um, adoption of these practices, getting things in place quickly, but this is all retroactive. As an example, as we highlighted in the blog, we helped the WHO get DMARC up and running and that's great. But I think the larger point, the larger takeaway for us is uh, much like humans, organizations commonly don't feel like they're gonna be a target until after they've already been targeted. And so I think it's important that we try and shift that mindset and encourage proactive investment in security. Now for email specific recommendations on how to protect yourself, um, first, I'd encourage everyone here to talk to your, uh, your organizations about ensuring that all of your email is strongly authenticated. Consider adopting DMARC if you haven't. At an individual level, if you're a Google user, uh, complete a security checkup. It's in your account settings in your control panel. If you feel like you might be higher risk, there are programs available to you like the Advanced Protection Program where you can ramp up your protections even further. For organizations on Google Workspace, uh, we built it to be secure by default, but you can take a look at some of the advanced phishing and malware controls that we have in the admin control panel. And generally just advice for everybody across the board. Be careful when you interact with emails that look like they're suspicious. Pay attention to your instincts. One of the things I commonly hear was, yeah, I was looking at that email. It did look a little suspicious, but I continued anyway. So pay attention to your spidey sense. It's usually right. And then finally, uh, two-factor authentication everywhere. Every account you have across the board, if it supports 2FA, it should be on. Great, thank you, Neil. Um, I'm gonna sure. move on to Nicole and then we'll we'll circle back and see if we have any time for audience uh, Q&A. Um, so Nicole, can you explain the role of notarization in identity and authentication? Sure, happy to do it. So notarizations have this extra layer of protection and identity and authentication with human assistance. So notaries prove you're you uh, traditionally in person. And, and I've recently heard a stat that about a billion documents, I don't know how accurate that is, I need to dig in and find out, are notarized each year in various areas like mortgage, auto finance, powers of attorney, and more. And so it continues to be a very grassroots state specific area of business. And so like many digital services, you know, last year states reacted to expand access to services, um, you know, keeping people at home and safe. And so this included notarizations. And so what came out of that are temporary laws and executive orders for something that once was a convenience quickly became a need with remote online notarization and providing that digital service. So um, I thought it was worth just taking a second to let you know where we all have all ended up on this grassroots notarization space. And, you know, it really comes down to, you know, two to five different types outside of a traditional notarization, which is in person include the wet signature. And so I'm gonna focus on and then the three most common outside the traditional. The first is the in-person remote uh, notarization or IPEN, and that includes an in-person 
physical signing table with electronic signature. Um, sometimes with an iPen, we see a hybrid of wet and electronic signatures. We see that a lot in the digital mortgage space. Um, second is a remote ink notarization or a RIN. And this includes a remote signing table through a computer or device, but without any of the safety or security future, uh, features of identity proofing or fraud prevention. And it includes a wet signature with paper being, you know, snail mailed back and forth between a signer and a notary. And I love, I love FaceTime, I love Skype, but remote ink notarization or RIN allows for you to do things like closings through, um, you know, a Zoom or a uh, FaceTime. And it, again, doesn't have the same identity proofing and authentication features attached to it. So then third, you have a remote online notarization, which is what Notarize does. And that allows for a digital signing table through technology device and platform with a digital signature. And there is a paper version of remote online notarization that, um, that includes paper being back and forth. But what Notarize does and what we're pushing is a remote online notarization process where you have multi-factor authentication in the front um, to prove that the, the signer is who the signer is. And then again, you have that last line of defense when you get onto the computer on your device of the notary having that live human interaction with an audio video recording. So again, all of these processes with this grassroots mindset is meant to have prod, prod prevention in mind. Great. Okay. And your perspective on how the pandemic has impacted identity and authentication. Sure. So, um, you know, again, we talked about digital services generally, and we've heard a lot from the other panelists in the notarization space. We've just seen a lot of growth in digital notarization <laughs> services and increased yeah. trust in the service. And so, um, education, you've again heard it and other, other speakers talk about it too, education on uh, digital services and remote online notarization just happened quickly out of necessity. And I don't mean just with consumers and notaries, but with states and regulators who, again, who provide that oversight. So um, as stewards of the government, you know, we've seen um, notaries have uh, remote online notarization as an extra tool in their toolbox as states have been passing laws. So Currently, 31 states allow uh, for remote online notarization. 29 of those are, are permanent, long-term. Only two are temporary, and we're working on those as we talk. Um, and as of today, an additional 14 to 15 states are looking at remote online notarization, whether it be permanent or some kind of amendment to the statute. And then on the industry side, it's worth mentioning that the American Land Title Association surveyed major remote online notar uh, notarization vendors like Notarize, and they indicated that the use of RON has gone up something like 457% during 2020 compared to 2019. And, and again, that came out of necessity. You know, we've been pushing remote online notarization for five, six, seven, some would say, you know, up to 10 years now. Um, but really consumers, notaries, and the trust within the processes really came out of last year. And so, you know, today Ron is being utilized most extensively in Florida, Texas, and Virginia. Um, but there's this trend significantly in the Midwestern states, and it's, it's being slowly but surely pushed across um, all 50. So it definitely sounds like the pandemic has provided an opportunity for adoption of uh, uh, notar online remote notarization. Um, what are some of the challenges that you see? So um, right now, I see, I see three areas. You know, first... Um, the real estate community has been great and they've been driving a lot of the advocacy at, at the at the state level at the national and at also the state level but you know the, we're still going to continue to see that balance of paper versus digital especially again when we're talking about one notarizations that are traditionally done free or or very cheap in person and then two things that you know industries like the real estate industry that is just now starting to get more digital and moving out of that paper space into the digital space and so I think continue uh, a continuation of education and and seeing trust in the process you know post whatever this next era is in the pandemic um will be will be important to watch as an opportunity and a challenge and then second in the same authentication space you know um 
I think that we need to, as an as a technology industry, be proactive with some of these other industries not used to the same technology advancements and be proactive about sharing those ideas and helping them understand. And I think this is something that we've run into in the real estate space as well, where um, they're really relying on knowledge-based authentication. What does that mean in the long term? And you know, just getting them up to speed on some of these authentication and identity verification technologies now, where maybe we need to start looking five years in the future of what they should be looking at ahead. So that's another space. And then the third one is, um, as we're watching and what happens in the new era post pandemic, you know, um, I think we need to think about the acronyms of RIN versus RON, you know, going back and again, remote ink notarization doesn't provide those same identity verification and multi-factor authentication that a remote online notarization has. And so while RIN may have been a short-term fix for states to allow access, we have been pushing for a full remote online notarization and as a permanent long-term solution. Um, so kind so of as a follow-up to, to that, to your to your point, um, yeah. the question came in, I think, related to this point. How does your process align with, or does it align with 863, the digital identity guidelines uh, for identity proofing standards, especially the remote supervised controls? So that's a good question. Then I will follow up with it. What I can tell you is that um, our process is a multi-factor process. So it includes one, you know, identity verification of taking a picture of a credential front and back. Um, two, um, right now we use, um, you know, knowledge-based authentication questions again, or authentication is driven by the real estate industry. Um, and then three, again, we have that last line of defense of the notary. Um, all of that is within the NIST guidelines. I mean, we've been trying, this is why it's really important for us to be part of the Bi Better Identity Coalition, to be part of, of groups that are working with NIST, because we want to make sure that what we're doing works with not only the notary, so when the notary gets to the table, um, they feel confident, but that we're following federal guidelines as well. And so we work, we strive to have that gold standard of not just state um, compliance, but also a federal guidance. Great. I can follow up with that question as well. Great. Th thank you. Um, I want to go back to Sanjay. Um, I, can you speak a little bit briefly about reimagining the social security number with a digital version? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. So I kind of want to start by saying we all get an identity when we're born, uh, especially in this country, at least the United States, So, which is called the social security number. And we're talking about the identity and the linkage to fraud. Oftentimes, there's a lot of effort that goes into confirming who you are, are you are. And so what I'm trying to say here is the fact that, you know, the paper base, you know, the credit card size, little piece of paper you get uh, with your social security number on it. Uh, it's time to reimagine that given that, uh, you know, especially as Nicole was talking about, we need to get away from paper into the digital era. And so what I'm saying here is really, that the social security number could be uh, a version which is created in a digital form. Uh, there are many ways to sort of think about it. And I'm just not suggesting that this is the only solution, but using like distributed ledger technology, you could create a unique form of identification, which is akin to your social security number. And that can then help you be processed because we in the government are processing, you know, unique numbers like social security numbers for processing various citizen services. And we spend an awful amount of work and time and effort in confirming that the person who's saying, I am John Smith, I am indeed John Smith, and this is my unique identifier. So my point here is that if we reimagine our social security number and we create some form of a digital version of it, and that becomes a form of using for providing the government services, at least for individuals, I think that is the way we should be you know, challenging ourselves uh, and looking at that new frontier which sort of changes the whole paradigm of the digital world that we are talking about. And, and I'm, I'm here to say that this forum is probably a good opportunity for the policymakers and or other folks to sort of, you know, um, continue to build on that idea and love to sort of participate in that. So back to you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, so kind of a related question again, this Nicole, this one's for you that came in from the audience. What sort of changes do state regulations need to make to enable remote notarizations um, and the commenter says in their, in their opinion, there are technical controls, but also regulatory controls. Would like to hear your thoughts. 
Sure. So as we've been working um, across all 50 states, um, there are a couple different state model laws that are out there. One is a mortgage uh, Bankers Association American Line title model. And then the other is a uniform law commission um, model that took two years to put together. Both of those include um, a multi-factor authentication and it, the legislation allows for um, a broad, um, the legislation is broad to allow for technology advancements. And then as we move into the regulation space, we work with the secretaries of state to figure out what works best for them. And I think what you've seen um, most common across the board has been um, this identity verification with some credential analysis, um, again, of, you know, most of the time what we see is a, a driver's license um, for that credential analysis. And then again, the knowledge-based authentication questions. I think as the remote online notarization um, process continues, what we'll see is um, some changes in those standards going forward. So for instance, um, I'm the vice chair of the Mortgage Bankers Association, MISMO, um, which is their standards setting organization. Um, they're reopening the remote online notarization standards to look at them again already, even though they just did them. But because of the pandemic, we learned a lot as Ron scaled and we can go back and provide better standards for those technical requirements that you're talking about. So that's in real time. And if anybody's interested in joining the MISMO um, working group, you can. Um, those conversations are just starting um, this actually next week. And so if you want to be part of that standard setting process, um, you can do that. And then what we'll take is those standards and then take them to secretaries of states as well so that we can keep with technology advancements. Great. So we have just a few minutes left. I'm just checking to see if we have any more questions coming in. Um, but as, as I do that, um, here, here's a question coming in. Um, is there any role for identity insurance services to facilitate purely financial online transactions? I'll just take a quick stab at it. I don't believe I'm okay. aware of one, but uh, I think uh, kind of looking back at if we create a digital form of identity and which can be reusable and can be authenticated as well as validated, I think that would be the foundation in my assessment uh, of enabling a more digital only workflow and digital only transactions, whether it is for insurance purposes or it's for uh, real estate purposes, it's for grants purposes, loans purposes, all of the above. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would add to that, um, just sort of the difference between verification and validation, and that you know a lot of the, the types of frauds we see are not just identity theft, but also synthetic identity. And so a lot of the technologies we're talking about are to uh, to verify and confirm uh, that the identities match. But if the individuals that are committing the fraud are actually creating identities from scratch, they have all of the answers to knowledge-based authentication questions, for example right, if they've created that identity. And the common scenario uh, that, that Sanjay alluded to is that, you know, when a child is issued a social security number, they usually don't use that social in the credit system in the United States until they become an adult, right? They're 16, 17, 18, or they go to college, they get a credit card, uh, and then often find that, oh my gosh, my social has been used with another identity for the last 10 years. Uh, and so those are some of the problems where there are point solutions that can help in, in sort of different points in the ecosystem or, or in the life cycle. Um, but we really need to be thinking holistically about making sure we have a process uh, so that those synthetic identities aren't created in the first place, right? Or, or we're able to identify them when they are, uh, which is really a different type of challenge. So, and probably a conversation for a whole nother conference, uh, but because I, I know we're just about out of time, but, but that would be uh, my comment on that. James, I, I believe you have the last word because we're, we're about to hit 1240. Um, I think we could go on. Um, the, the, I see some questions up here, but I think they would take several minutes to, to run through uh, answers on. So just want to take the opportunity to thank you all for participating on this panel. It was great. Um, and then I guess I'll hand it back over to Jeremy. Hey, thank you, Jamie and everybody in the panel. That was a great discussion.